Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Daniel Ogeto and I am the creative at Genghis Capital. And uh, in today's webinar, we are going to uh, have our very own, that is Caleb Mugendi, an, an investment associate at uh, Genghis Capital. And he's going to take us through uh, the performance of uh, retirement benefit schemes in 2020. So uh, some housekeeping before we get started, uh, some housekeeping rules before we get started is, should you have any question during the presentation, please type them into the uh, question box in your uh, control panel, and then I'll bring them up at the end of the presentation. Now, without uh, any further ado, uh, we'll turn over to Caleb, who will take us through the presentation of the day. Thank you very much for attending, and Caleb, over to you. Thank you, Geto. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us in today's uh, personal investment webinar. Today we'll be tackling uh, retirement benefit schemes and how they performed last year, given last year was a year of challenges. We know we had the COVID uh, pandemic breaking out. So we just want to see how your retirement benefit assets performed during that period. So I'll be sharing my screen at how retirement benefits schemes performed in the year 2020. We'll go through a slight introduction to retirement benefit schemes. This building on what we had previously tackled when we were introducing pensions. Uh, how retirement benefit scheme assets are invested. We'll then go into the 2020 performance by retirement benefit schemes, and then we'll figure out how to choose between a segregated and a guaranteed scheme. So just an intro uh, to retirement benefit schemes. These allow members to make regular contributions during their working years and thereafter get a retirement income from the schemes upon retirement. Basically, as you work uh, during your employment years or during your uh, working years, you're able to make contributions into a scheme. And then after retirement, then you're able to get uh, income from your invested uh, uh, contribution and invested funds upon retirement. So the Retirement Benefits Authority regulates this industry, uh, the pensions industry. It was formed in 2000 uh, in order to strengthen government's management and effective running of the retirement benefits industry with the main aim of protecting members' benefits. And the three pillars are mainly the zero pillar, where this is state-funded pensions for citizens over the age of 65 and just to provide them a basic income. And this is managed by the Ministry in Charge of Social Protection, the first pillar is mandatory to all workers. And here's where the mandatory contribution is by both the employer and employees. And this is where the National Social Security Fund, NSSF, comes in. And then we have the second pillar, which is mainly employer-based, and the contribution is voluntary. You can have, an, this is where you have the occupational umbrella and personal retirement scheme for, if you want to take a personal, uh, join a personal retirement benefit scheme, you will come under the second pillar, which is what we are going to mainly focus on. And the retirement benefits industry has registered growth since uh, the, during the last decade from 2014. Uh, as at the end of 2020, we had assets under management of uh, had assets of 1.4 trillion shillings as at the end of last year. And this is a compound annual growth rate of 10.9% since 2014, where assets were 750 billion shillings to the now current 1.4 trillion. However, there's still some more room for growth as pension coverage is still only about 20% of the entire working population in the country. Look at the segregated schemes versus the guaranteed schemes. Uh, segregated funds are where your members' contributions are invested directly uh, by the trustees via an appointed fund manager. And the trustees are able to establish an appropriate investment policy for the scheme, which is then implemented by the fund manager. And the scheme directly holds the investments and the returns are fully accrued to the scheme for the benefit of members. So there's segregated funds uh, where you, you, you join a fund and all the returns are fully accrued to members of the scheme and directly go to benefit those members, depending on whether you did this, despite whether the fund did a positive return or a negative return, it all accrues to the members. Uh, 
For guaranteed funds, these are the funds that offer that are offered mainly by insurance companies, and the members' contributions are pulled together, and the insurance company is able to guarantee a minimum rate of return to the the fund. The maximum is usually four percent by law, so you can't guarantee anything more than four percent. That does not mean that the maximum that you can earn from a guaranteed fund is four percent. No, no, it means that the maximum that they can guarantee to give you every year is four percent. So should the actual return surpass the minimum guaranteed return, the insurance company can top this up with a minimum rate or a bonus rate of return. So basically, in a guaranteed fund, the minimum that you can actually get is 4% or, 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 the, or any of the prescribed uh, minimum that the insurance company uh, prescribes as a minimum rate of return. However, you do have potential to accrue or, or to get or to earn more than the 4% when uh, the assets in the in the scheme perform uh, well during the year. And then the insurance company will be able to top up that uh, minimum rate of return with a bonus rate of return for the year. Usually how it works is uh, the insur these guaranteed funds are mainly offered by insurance companies. And the insurance company then is able to guarantee that minimum rate of return. Should the return uh, exceed the minimum rate of return, they can keep some of it as a surplus or like a buffer should there be a, a down year in the following year or in the following couple of years. However, they are able to top up that minimum rate of return with a bonus rate of return. So these are the main two types of schemes that we we'll look at in terms of return performance and try to figure out uh, which is better between the two or which one should you join or what the returns have been uh, for, for the past couple of years in both the segregated and the guaranteed scheme and what affects these returns. So we'll move on to how return benefit scheme assets are invested. Basically, the investment limits are prescribed by the Retirement Benefits Authority that uh, came up with guidelines on how retirement benefit schemes assets should be invested. And this is contained in a table that we call or refer to as table G and is as follows. The different asset categories on the left, the maximum allowable limit uh, that the fund can invest in is on in the next column on the right. So look at the government securities, the maximum allowable limit is 90%. So basically a fund can invest up to 90% of its assets in government securities. That's what it means. For the quoted equities, you can invest up to 70%. Immovable property up to 30%. Guaranteed funds is the highest at 100%. Listed corporate bonds at 20, fixed deposits at 30, offshore investments at 15, cash uh, at 5%, unquoted equities at 5%, private equity at 10, REITs at 30, and all exchange traded derivative contracts that are approved by CMA at 5, and others, uh, for example, uh, unlisted commercial paper, the maximum allowable limit is 10%. So basically, when fund managers are formulating uh, the investment policy state, the statement uh, in con conjunction with the trustee, they have to come up with an IPS that actually uh, follows these maximum allowable limits and invest according to this uh, table. So they should follow the IPS, and the IPS should come from, uh, uh, sh should adhere to these maximum allowable limits in these various asset classes. So that's how the investment limits are portrayed uh, in the different asset classes. When we look at 2020, uh, the asset class allocation in the major asset classes, we have uh, public or traditional asset classes, which is mainly your fixed income and your equities. And then we also have uh, private or uh, alternative asset classes where we have uh, things like property and real estate, offshore investments and private equity. So for 2020, the asset allocation was mainly in traditional assets, classes, the asset classes with fixed income at around 72.8 and equities at 20.8. Then we had property at 5.4 and offshore at 2.4. This was, as we said, uh, still within the prescribed limits by the RBA as fixed income for security. We can proceed to the next slide. We'll just finish talking, talking about the asset allocation uh, with all of them being within the prescribed limits. We'll then move on to asset class performance in 2020, where equities registered a negative return in 2020 as the market uh, uh, had a, a negative performance following, again, as we talked about the COVID-19 pandemic. 
while the offshore actually outperformed with a return of 37%, and fixed income had a return of 13% in the year. So as we can see, fixed income still had a positive return uh, given uh, the, the nature of uh, the fixed income securities that give a fixed return. However, equities that's a bit more volatile, a, a bit more subjective to uh, as investor sentiment and macroeconomic conditions. It had a negative return as the market sold off last year. And then offshore had a, a, a way positive return of that 7%. Uh, this is despite the, the, the decline in uh, global markets early in the year of going to COVID. There was a, a quick uh, or a strong rebound in the same. It was the second half of the year and that enabled the offshore uh, asset class to have a positive performance. Next slide. So look at the segregated funds performance uh, for the past five years. Usually to get this performance, we look at two uh, industry leaders in, in providing uh, uh, pension and, uh, fund performance over the years. This is the acts of consulting and Zamara uh, companies that produce the main reports on the industry performance for retirement benefit schemes. And this is also, and they generate these reports by contacting the various schemes and the schemes are then are able to uh, give the, the returns that they got or the returns that they uh, were able to achieve during the period. So the, the two reports usually have similar uh, returns. As you can see uh, from 2016, the reports are almost similar in most of the years. So in 2020, both Axov and Zamara had a 7.3% uh, return for segregated funds, and that is what we'll take as a return for segregated funds over that period of time. You can go to the next slide. So in 2020, as we discussed, the average return was 7.3%. This was a huge decline from uh, 2019's return of 17.1%. Uh, and this is also below the average five year average return of 11.2% uh, of segregated uh, schemes. As we said, this was mainly attributed to the decline in equity markets performance, where despite the, uh, where not only did the market uh, decline in terms of the asset prices or the stock share prices, there also a dividend drought from most of the companies. So a lot of companies are also not paying dividends and entering dividends, so that also uh, ate away into the return. So on the, on the average five year, however, we had uh, a very good performance in 2017 and 2019, 2017 at 18.4% and 2019 at 17.1%. And despite 2020 being a down year, we still uh, had a better performance in segregated funds than in 2018. 2018, again, the equity market again was uh, on the decline, and that's also ate into a lot of the returns for segregated schemes. As you can see, the segregated schemes' returns are a bit uh, volatile. Uh, they're dependent, obviously, on market forces, uh, on the especially on the equity market uh, performance, because if the equity market does well, uh, uh, a lot of the funds that are invested in equities also uh, will do well, uh, the 20 to 30 percent. However, if the equities does not do well, then uh, the average return will also be a bit lower because most of the funds are still invested in equities. All right, we can go to the next uh, slide. For returns by guaranteed schemes, we had a return of 8.4 in 2020. This was higher than the return from segregated schemes, which came in at 7.3. So for, as you can see, for guaranteed schemes, the volatility in returns is not as high from 8.9, the, the lowest being 8.4 in 2018 and 2020, with the highest being 10.1 in 2019. So for guaranteed schemes, again, uh, the five-year average is at 9.1%. It's still lower than what the five-year average in segregated funds is, despite the outperformance by guaranteed schemes in 2020. As you said, guaranteed schemes are able to offer you a minimum return. And then uh, if the assets generated are higher than a higher return than the minimum return, they're able to uh, put some of that return in reserve and not distributed to members and then distributed to members, let's say in a down year. So let's say the return in 2019, which was around 17% uh, for syndicated funds, 
for guaranteed schemes was uh, 10%. However, it doesn't mean that the, all the uh, schemes performed at 10%, their guaranteed schemes may be performed quite higher, but they're able to keep some of that uh, performance or some of that return in reserve and uh, dish it out in 2020 to cushion members from the uh, uh, poorer performance in 2020. So that's the guaranteed schemes average. As you can see, the volatility is not as much as syndicated schemes. However, the return is less than, the return is less on a five-year average than the segregated schemes. Going to the next slide. So as we compare the segregated schemes and guaranteed schemes, as I said again, uh, there was outperformance by uh, the guaranteed schemes in 2020 at 8.4 from uh, against 7.3. There was outperformance in 2016 and 2018. Uh, again, 2018 was a down year for equities, and that's why there was a uh, so smaller, less than uh, uh, performance by the segregated schemes. However, in terms of 2017 and 2019, there was a huge outperformance by segregated schemes where they were able to give a return of 18% in 2017 and a return of 17% in 2019. So looking at this, uh, the five-year average is at 11.2 for segregated schemes. This is almost a two percentage point uh, outperformance versus guaranteed schemes, uh, despite the fact that the guaranteed schemes have actually performed better than segregated schemes in three out of the past five years. This is again because of the fact that uh, the, the guaranteed schemes are able to uh, cushion the members in down years by keeping some of the return in, in reserve and uh, dishing it out when they, there's a down year. Uh, that, is, that way they're able to almost uh, uh, the, 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 the returns are almost uh, similar despite the ups and downs in the in the market. Segregated so schemes, on the other hand, they dish out all the returns that they receive to members in the same year, and that's why we have outperformance in the year 2017 and 2019. All right. So if you compare the returns, we see that segregated schemes are highly dependent on market performance and all the returns are attributed to the members. Guaranteed scale, on the other hand, they have a more stable return. Uh, most insurance companies do not have an obligation to distribute all the returns that they attain in a given year. Guaranteed schemes instead uh, distribute the minimum guaranteed return uh, regardless of the investment performance. And if the performance is higher than the guaranteed rate, they will they were able to hold some of the return in reserve, and this can show up the returns in a down year. So this is also dependent on the discretion of these insurance companies to decide how much to top up on the minimum rate of return and the bon with a bonus rate of return. So it's basically at the discretion of the insurance company how much return that they'll top up uh, from the, the actual return or the, how much they'll top up from the minimum guaranteed return. Yeah. So when we come to choosing between a segregated and guaranteed scene, we've seen from both uh, uh, sides that there are advantages in both, with the guaranteed scheme having an advantage that the members' contributions are protected since they earn a minimum rate of return. And again, the scheme doesn't require a lot of management since investment of the fund is handled by the insurance company. For segregated schemes, on the other hand, the advantages are the members are get to receive the returns and through their contribution, all the returns. So if the market does well, then uh, the members' returns and the members' funds grow at a faster pace. As we've seen in the last five years, the segregated scheme members' returns have grown at a faster pace despite the volatility. And again, through the trustee, the member of the schemes have a level of control on how their funds are invested. Coming to the cons on both the guaranteed uh, scheme, one of the disadvantages is that the rate of the return is determined exclusively by the insurance company, and maybe it, it may be lower than the overall market performance during the year, as the insurance company will have some direct uh, say on what returns will go to reserve and what will be distributed to members. And then for segregated schemes, the members are not protected by minimum rate of return, and the return is based on market performance. So again, if the market doesn't perform well, uh, and it's an aggressive uh, scheme, then uh, there are possibility that the members might uh, get their, their, their funds eaten away 
if the pension fund, if the pension administrator, the pension fund manager is a bit uh, too aggressive in a down year, for instance. Uh, like for instance, last year when uh, the equities market declined, if these pension schemes had invested up to the maximum allowable limit of 70%, then a number of uh, uh, schemes will have registered a negative performance in 2020. So there, those are the main advantages and disadvantages when you're looking at guaranteed schemes and segregated schemes. And what factors should you consider when you're looking at a guaranteed scheme versus a segregated scheme? First of all, the risk appetite. Uh, guaranteed funds are suitable for members with low risk appetite as there's a minimum return that is guaranteed. This again, however, translates to lower returns compared to the segregated schemes as we've seen from a five-year average, which are mostly preferred by schemes with higher risk appetite. So when you look at the risk appetite, you can also risk, look at the risk appetite by individual fund managers. Uh, some uh, fund managers uh, of uh, guaranteed schemes are risk averse. So most of their um, investments will be in fixed, fixed income securities as compared to equities or offshore. And some are a bit more aggressive. Some, some uh, schemes are a bit more aggressive and they'll invest a bit more in offshore instruments and in equities as compared to fixed income securities. So depending on your risk appetite, you as an individual uh, member contributing uh, some of your funds, that's one of the key areas that you look at in terms of choosing between a guaranteed scheme and a segregated scheme. Again, we'll also look at the returns. If you're looking for higher returns, you're best suited to invest in a segregated scheme due to its higher risk uh, in nature and risk appetite of uh, the, the segregated scheme as compared to uh, a guaranteed scheme. So if you're looking for higher returns on your invested or on your contributions as a member, then the segregated scheme is uh, the better choice for you. And then again, the age liability of the scheme also matters. Uh, again, if you're close to retirement, you generally will want to be a bit more conservative. And then it's so, so hence it's better to invest in a guaranteed scheme as a certainty of returns. And you can't risk as much when you're more closer to retirement uh, by going into, let's say, a, a risk, uh, a quite uh, a risk aggressive uh, segregated fund that might uh, have uh, uh, its returns based on the market performance. So if the market goes down, then again, your returns might, your, 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 your funds might lose value. So if you have a long way to retirement, then you're better off again in a segregated fund as they have consistently outperformed uh, the guaranteed returns in looking at a long-term uh, uh, horizon. So then uh, looking at uh, an example of a segregated uh, scheme, we have the GenCap individual pension plan. And just a bit about the scheme, it's designed to enable individuals to save for their retirement by making regular contributions during their working years and growing this, the, growing this and growing their retirement savings. So it's open to be joined by professionals where we have anyone in the, uh, who, who's uh, employed uh, in, in the, uh, in the economy, we have the lawyers, doctors, engineers, etc., and who don't belong to a retirement benefit scheme. We also have self-employed individuals. We have businessmen, jokali artisans, uh, musicians, shopkeepers, etc., can also join and make regular contributions since there's no uh, prescribed uh, 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 contribution that you can make. Uh, uh, there's no limit, though there is a minimum contribution of 1,000 per month. We also have groups of individuals whose employers don't have a, a registered uh, retirement benefit schemes. Let's say you, you're part of a school or an NGO and you don't have a formal retirement benefit scheme in your place of work, you can join it as an individual uh, into the GenCap individual pension plan. And again, employers of SMEs who don't have an professional scheme, they can also uh, sign up their, their employees and uh, uh, them themselves as an individual into this uh, individual pension plan. So now with features, it has a low minimum contribution of 1,000 shillings per month and upon retirement, the member will access all the accumulated contributions as a lump sum. And uh, I think uh, that brings us to the end of today's presentation and uh, investment webinar. I will open the floor back to Ogeto if there are any questions on the same. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Caleb, for that uh, very nice presentation. Now uh, we will go to uh, the Q and A section where uh, you can see all uh, the questions have been uh, taken care of by our colleague Alice Kabao, but we can maybe go through them so that other members can also uh, uh, can also know what has been acquired. There are three open questions. Yeah. Okay. So Stella M is asking for GenCap Gen pension, pension plan, if one misses a monthly contribution, is there a penalty? And could you provide the rates of returns for this specific fund for the last two years? All right. So for GenCap uh, individual pen pension plan, uh, there is no penalty if, if you do miss uh, uh, a contribution. And uh, since we did start the plan uh, or the scheme, in 2020, mid 2020. So our returns for last year have not yet been audited. However, uh, the audited returns came in at around 19%. So we did start it in between the, the year. So we don't have a whole full year worth of uh, uh, data to, to, to uh, uh, share with the public yet. So we uh, audited, yeah. Uh, Liz Mwangi had asked whether we can share the slides with, with her. Uh, Liz, after the presentation, uh, you, you know, after the, this presentation, you'll receive a link uh, to our YouTube uh, uh, page where we'll post this uh, this whole presentation there after editing it and uh, just adding something, uh, adding it to our playlist. Now, Stella, wait. James Carrier is asking, can you can you set your retirement age? Can you set your retirement age? Uh, it depends on, again, the industry that you, or sector that you're working for. Let's say you're working for the government. There are some uh, uh, sectors or uh, uh, um, there's the a retirement age that's prescribed, uh, especially in the public sector. If you work in the private sector, there, there are some companies that also do prescribe a, a recommended retirement age. However, if you're working for yourself, again, there is no, uh, <laughs> you don't have to self-retire. It depends on what, what you, what you, what you uh, want to go and do after. So you can retire early, you can retire late. There are other people also who opt for early retirement, uh, especially when there's a restructuring in company, the people who can opt for early retirement, but that is still uh, considered retirement. So there's no age set in stone, though we do look at around 65 as uh, uh, the general age of retirement, also be based on the uh, expected uh, uh, lifespan of, uh, of, uh, of the country. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Gloria Kidula is asking, uh, you gave examples of uh, segregated schemes. Can you also give an example of, a guarantee, of the guaranteed funds? All right, for guaranteed funds, as we highlighted, they are mainly offered by insurance companies. So most of the insurance companies will give you uh, a guaranteed fund. Uh, there, there are many ways that they can package this uh, uh, way of uh, uh, retirement uh, scheme, saving schemes. Uh, most of the large insurance companies do have uh, uh, guaranteed funds. Uh, Thank you for that. Uh, Michael Mugo had asked what was the performance of the GenCap IPP in 2020. So I think uh, Caleb has already covered this. Uh, we started mid 2020 and our unaudited uh, performance uh, was at a yield of 19%, if I'm not wrong, Caleb. Yes, yes, that's correct. So Nyathioma uh, Njehu is asking, the historical returns you gave for segregated schemes were only for Two particular schemes. Come again, two only two particular schemes. No, but that's, that, that's not uh, how it is. Basically, what happens is the two were the, the two uh, Zamara and uh, Atsav are the main. Uh, we'll talk. We'll say like consultancy uh, based. Uh, 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 companies that do investment reports on the retirement benefits uh, industry. And they are the ones who compile and generate these uh, reports. And they, what they do is that they look at the average uh, return across the board from all the schemes that are participating. And it's usually between 
around the, the, the response is almost 70 to 80 percent of all the assets in the retirement benefit schemes by fund managers who do participate in uh, these reports. So what, what, what we show there is the average from all those schemes that, that did participate in, in these reports. So we use the average for, for, the, for, the, for the returns. Kevin Duby is asking, kindly elaborate on the tax consequences of a lump sum payment upon retirement, that is of the GenCap IPP, and then can the payment be done in tranches? Okay, for, for the GenCap IPP, uh, we do a lump sum at the end of, uh, uh, basically when you do retire, we, we, we do a lump sum. And for the tax benefit, it, it, it's uh, how it, your taxable income will be a bit, uh, there's no one uh, ban in terms of the taxation. Uh, basically, it's up until a certain uh, amount of money that uh, is tax exempt, and then the rest shall be taxed. So how we look at it is uh, you will receive the, the lump sum. However, we also do have another um, uh, product where you can uh, switch from your lump sum payment to get a drawdown upon retirement. That is known as the GenCap uh, uh, individual drawdown, uh, income drawdown fund. So once you do receive your your in, your lump sum income at retirement, you're able to join a drawdown fund where you can get monthly or uh, uh, payments depending on the on the uh, mode of frequency that you that you prefer. You can do it monthly, usually it's monthly, uh, quarterly, half yearly, or even annually. So you can join a once you get your lump sum, you can join an income drawdown fund. Okay, uh, Joan Rungai is asking, what is your base mode of pension investment, segregated or guaranteed? And then how secure is your pension scheme from ex externalities and internal factors such as receivership of the company or bankruptcy? All right. So uh, in terms of the first question, uh, the base is a segregated fund. Uh, as we know, we, we are we do have a trustee and a fund manager, and, and we are act as a fund managers. So we, the only, uh, the only uh, scheme that we can offer is a segregated fund. Given that we're also not an insurance company, we can't offer a minimum a guarantee and a minimum guarantee on investment, so we can't give a guaranteed fund. And uh, then looking at... Uh, how the funds are invested again we said that the the fund is uh, governed by a trustee and uh, uh, the fund is governed by a trustee and then we're thus we're able to segregate these funds away from uh, company funds so that even if there is an issue with the company we are still able to access our retirement benefit schemes as they, these are segregated funds there's also a fund administ a pension administrator who does the fund administration in the in the in, in in the structure so there's a trustee there's a fund manager and there's a fund administrator so in terms of us we, we do, do, even if the company were to uh, go uh, bankrupt as we said there, there, there are no uh, liabilities or no externalities that will affect your retirement benefits savings and funds Okay, uh, Stella M is asking, what assets then does the GenCap uh, IPP plan invest in? That we invest in, we do invest in uh, fixed income and uh, the equities, equity asset classes uh, currently. Uh, we're also looking at uh, the offshore uh, asset as an asset class, but currently we're only invested in fixed income securities and uh, equity securities that we're looking at. Okay, uh, Justin Oliwa is asking, how does uh, I think the drawdown work as a pension scheme? I think this is the income drawdown. Sure. So for the income drawdown is only eligible for uh, members upon uh, retirement. Um, the minimum should be around uh, 1 million shillings uh, to join. And then upon uh, joining, you're able to uh, hold those funds uh, and get a, a, a either monthly or quarterly or half yearly or annually uh, payout, usually for a period of 10 years. Uh, so the income drawdown usually runs for a period of 10 years where you're able to draw down uh, what you had invested for that entire amount, that entire period of time. Yeah. 
And then uh, Liz Mongi is asking, what is the difference between annuity and income drawdown? For annuity, uh, basically this gives you a, a given uh, payment, a given a rate of return uh, at the onset of when you uh, join that uh, annuity. So it gives you a given rate of return, it gives you a given uh, drawdown uh, over that said period of time. And uh, it's, it's not as uh, flexible as uh, as an income drawdown. The income drawdown, what happens is you also, uh, the funds are also invested. So you're also earning a return on what is remaining in the, in the on, on what you don't draw down from the fund. So you're also earning a return on that. So basically at, at the end of, uh, of, let's say 10 years, there's a possibility that uh, in your income drawdown fund, you'll still have uh, some more funds than if you had invested in an annuity. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Paul Kiruri is asking, which funds have, ho have offered the best returns for the past three years? For individual funds, that will be a bit uh, hard to uh, pinpoint, uh, given that they don't uh, actually, um, in, in these industry reports, we don't actually get the, the names of the funds that are performing uh, the highest uh, or, or those that are performing poorly. So it will be a bit uh, hard to pinpoint which uh, funds are performed or are performed uh, uh, previously. So in terms of names, we can't really uh, name which ones that have done that. Uh, the only thing that you can look at possibly is if you're, if you're uh, the retirement benefit scheme, if it's a large scheme or if it's a medium scheme or if it's a small scheme, usually uh, the, small, the, the small schemes have a, a tendency to uh, outperform uh, slightly than let's say the larger schemes uh, over the past couple of years. But uh, uh, pinpointing the, which exactly uh, retirement scheme that we're talking about might be a bit uh, difficult. Uh, Kevin Duby uh, is asking, can one do uh, lump sum deposits to their accounts or uh, this is, is this strictly to the agreed amount as signed up? You can do large uh, deposit in terms of uh, if you if you join the uh, Jengi's uh, uh, personal uh, scheme, you can do instead of doing let's say a monthly of one or five thousand monthly, you can opt to do uh, maybe twenty thousand for a quarter or fifty thousand for half year. So it is possible to do a lump sum kind of uh, investments, given it's a personal uh, pension plan. Okay, uh, Nelly Moriongi is asking, what are the consequences of uh, accessing the funds at 45 as opposed to accessing them at 65? And what is the minimum amount you can access without being taxed? Uh, in terms of accessing earlier than uh, uh, your retirement age, you won't be able to access um, your entire savings, especially if you did have employer contributions. So if you had employer contributions, let's say you, you want to access them, let's say you've moved jobs, or so you also want to move to a different uh, scheme, you're allowed to withdraw some, some part of your pension. Uh, despite this, though, uh, the maximum that you're able to withdraw, I think is uh, close to 100%. Uh, I think it's 75% uh, of all the funds because the 50% of your employer contributions is still locked. So you're not able to access that and the, the rest, Again, also there's, there's a part that is uh, required to be sent to another uh, pension scheme uh, before retirement. So you're not able to access the entirety of your of your funds. It comes to about 75% is what you can access. And then uh, the 50%, which is your employer contribution, which is around 25% of your total, has to go to another uh, retirement benefit scheme before you retire. Uh, what uh, was there another question? Um, apart, in terms of taxation, I, I'll still have to look at uh, the exact uh, figure of what is not uh, taxable. It comes to around, just from the top of my head, to, to, to have come to around 600 or so thousand over a couple of years. However, the exact details uh, is something that we can uh, get back to you on the minimum, just on the minimum that is not taxed. For the other part, you're going to be taxed uh, based on the income uh, bonds. Uh, 
six yeah, months. Thank you uh, for, for that, Caleb. Deborah Nyambo is asking, what is the interest rate for lump sum deposits? For example, three, six, or uh, nine months. Uh, come, come again, the, the lump interest, sum interest rates for yes. uh, This is, the, the way the pension uh, works is uh, uh, you, you're not given a guaranteed return. So uh, it, it depends obviously on, on what the, the assets that were invested from the, the fund assets, what they were able to yield uh, despite that three, six or, or, or 12 year period. So in terms of pension, th th there's no guaranteed return unless you go to a guaranteed fund that gives you a guaranteed yearly return of a maximum of 4%. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Caleb. I think there are no more questions uh, currently live. So uh, should you, or rather, if you missed part of this presentation or got it uh, midway, we will have a copy of the presentation which will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. Uh, the link, I have, I have shared it on the on the chat section. So maybe you can follow and see uh, other presentations that we've had for this webinar and other webinars that we have presented. And, uh, and Caleb, I don't know if you have any closing remarks. Just that uh, it is quite, uh, uh, quite a good start saving for retirement. Uh, it's not something that people usually discuss or, or, or take uh, into uh, a lot of consideration, especially since if you're just new into the workforce. However, in terms of the income replacement ratio, it's still quite low uh, in the country at around 25%, uh, despite uh, the recommended being around 75, meaning that upon uh, retirement, a lot of uh, uh, people only earn like 25% of what their last salary was. So it's always better to start uh, your retirement savings early, uh, get into a, a good scheme, try and do your research on, on which schemes uh, you prefer. If you're uh, a bit, uh, you have a longer period of time, it's, it's, as we talked about, it's better to join a segregated scheme. If you have a short period of time before retirement, then you can opt for a guaranteed scheme. And then let's be, be diligent in your contributions. Uh, even, this, even if your employer not contributing, also be diligent in contribution so that you are able to access these funds upon your retirement and have a, a good life in uh, a comfortable standard of living upon your retirement. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Caleb, for those uh, quite insightful remarks and the presentation. And uh, maybe you, uh, yeah. So, should you want to start today? Uh, Genghis Capital is there for you, and you can open uh, Genghis uh, IPP, that is the individual pension plan, and start saving little by little today, which will be, will come uh, at retirement. You will be at a better point to maybe take on the investment plan or rather invest in something that you wanted or even uh, have uh, money for survival. So without uh, much further ado, I'd like to maybe close this presentation here and thank you uh, for carving out your time and attending this uh, webinar. We appreciate uh, that you have come here to learn and we are here for you. And should you want to uh, any other details, please do not hesitate. Just uh, email us at distribution at capitalcom Thank you very much, Caleb, and see you in the next one.